a little better. Yeah. Oh yeah, you got that warm glow going. Yeah, the thing is, uh, well, it's one thing maybe we can talk about is I've been having some stomach issues, and um, so I don't know if it's from taking the kratom or what the deal is, but like getting backed up, and and uh, so I just been, I wish drank like four glasses of lemonade because like the lemon I guess helps the acidity in the stomach, so that's why I had to pee so bad. I'm like, I drank like four glasses of lemonade in like <laughs> like a half an hour. But wait, so you. Have you been drinking the lemonade? Are you having like, um, what do they call it, acid reflux? Or are you just having issues with, uh, you know, frequency going to the bathroom? Yeah, no, I'm, I think it's just I'm constipated, you know. Okay. Or, or, well, so yeah, it's you, not- you know, the opiates slow down the digestive tract, unfortunately. <laughs> right. But it's not an opiate, but it kind of mimics the opiate in a little way. No, no. So the, the kratom has at least like five metabolites not just the alkaloids, but when your body metabolizes them into other metabolites, yeah, yeah. one of them is strong, is more potent at the mu opioid receptor than heroin is. So really? some of them, but the thing is, it also has other uh, molecules that are adrenergic. They're, they they work on adrenaline. So that's why some strains will get you more up. And, and obviously, yeah. it's a much safer alternative. It's not. I'm not comparing it to an opiate, but I mean, that's how it yeah, works yeah, mechanically. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, but no, anyway, I don't. But I mean, that's, I'm like glad to hear that. I'm learning from about it. It works well for my headaches. I'll send you a couple of tips after uh, of supplements that because I, I used to have Crohn's disease, which is the most severe GI disease. Yeah, like yeah. there's colitis and Crohn's. I still have it technically, but I haven't had symptoms for two years. And I, I use certain. Yeah, I don't even take medicine for it, but I use certain supplements and practices that help me a lot. I'll tell you about them after the show. Yeah. But yeah. for the audience that hasn't met Gunner yet, gunner has been on my show before. He's a friend of mine. He has a wonderful channel. I'm going to link it down below. So I want everyone to go check it out. Gunner is one of the most fantastic storytellers. I watch his stories all the time. He's funny even when he doesn't intend to be. And he has really funny stories. But Gunnar and me wanted to catch up. Before we do, before we talk about what we want to talk about today, briefly, I just want to ask, how's your wife doing? How's things going in Michigan? Are you guys been protected from this China virus? How's things been going on with you guys? Well, thank you for asking me. For It's funny because you and I are very similar in a lot of ways. And, and it's funny because the first thing I was going to ask you is how is you and your, your wife and, you know, the baby and everything. And I want to hear that, too. My wife and I are doing good. We both work from home, so we don't get exposed to a lot of people. You know, we, um, you know, she, she works for a Wall Street company. She's a sales representative for databases at a company that aggregates like stock um, trends and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But and so we don't go out much. I did have to go to St. Louis a couple of weeks ago to be on Seth Ferente's new documentary about the mafia and the um, uh, drugs involvement in the mafia. But uh, other than that, I, we're doing good. You know, we got a little homestead. I live out, out in the woods, you know, northern Michigan. I have, um, you know, it's funny. It's sometimes you get people are like, oh, man, you're like a hillbilly. You live. I'm like, dude, I live. My dream. I live where I yeah, yeah exactly. I, I live basically where everybody else saves up all year so they can take a vacation for a few days to go camping or a week or you know, whatever. That's where I live. And it's beautiful. I have 20 acres in the middle of nowhere. No neighbors on top of me. It's just gorgeous here. I go deer hunting. I go fishing. And so we just, I got four chickens, four cats, me and my wife. We just enjoy life, kind of live the simple, quiet, slow life. Both of us work very hard and, you know, put in a lot of hours. But, um, you know, we got I can hear my chicken right now roosting. Out. He's like, he probably hears me. He, whenever he hears me talking by the house, he starts crowing. Rrr, 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 he's, he's a <laughs> punk. His name is his name is Jimmy Hoffa, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You guys have an obsession with that Hoffa guy. You know, my wife I, really I, wants. I don't as well. You should get him. You should get him. I don't have an obsession with Jimmy Hoffa. My wife named him Jimmy Hoffa because she said if that thing keeps acting a fool he's gonna come up missing <laughs> because because he attacks you he he protects the hens they've got three hens and if you go by them or him really he'll attack you flat out jump at your face with his spurs and try to bang, get you it's funny as hell it attacks the crap out of us you gotta ah, it's crazy they're masculine because, that's why penises oh, are yeah. talks <laughs> that's the reason yeah, they're yeah. really masculine yeah he also heard the term bird brain and it's just one of the things because it does, doesn't matter like how much i kick them away or or, or or like I punk him out or yell, ah, get out. He don't care. He don't, well, it don't bother him at all. He thinks he's the baddest man on the block. That's why Gunner, that's why I get bored when I have, like, I tried to adopt a, like a lizard and stuff like that, but oh, they, don't, no. they don't have, they don't know you're there. They don't know who no. you are. No. They don't no. even recognize this as the same dude feeding me every day. They have no, no idea. No. And I think sometimes they don't even know it's a person moving, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. but that's great. Here. How's your, are you working on a new book and how's your radio show going? Cause I want to let so, the guys know you have a radio show too. 
Yes, yes. So what? And just to, to touch one more thing on that note, I have four cats, which which a lot of people who've never had like cool cats would be sh- just astonished by how much personality some cats have. And they're really funny. They're like a funny little animal, man. I love them, dude. All four of them are completely different and they're just ridiculous. And, uh, and I, I basically stole my neighbor's cats when I first moved here, they started coming around. I didn't, I didn't know what a barn cat is. And I, I I'm from Detroit. So you hear like barn cat, you think oh, it's a stray cat. So nobody's really, you know, it's just a stray. And then my wife is just barn cat. Cause they get, they're like 300 yards away. My nearest neighbor. And they got a barn. This guy's a farmer kind of, and the cat started coming around when I first got moved here. And I didn't talk to the neighbors at all. And one day, this is a funny story, man. Uh, so this little black cat, the day we got out of the car, like when we were unpacking, we just drove 17 hours from Missouri. And the cat's like running in of our house. You don't even know who this cat this is. It's some random little black cat, real cute little thing. And she, so next thing you know, she's coming around. We're feeding it a little, feeding it a little. And then the one day, like two weeks after I'm here, the neighbor who we haven't met yet comes walking down my driveway, which is like 200 yards long. I see him coming like, oh, that must be the neighbor. I'm working on the tree stand of my, my, my hunting stand, the ladder. And they come walking up. And before they say anything, the lady says, oh, th- that's my cat. And literally <laughs> just this is what I say. I say, and I meant it to be funny, but in hindsight, it probably wasn't. I said, this, this your cat? This ain't your cat. This is my cat now. <laughs> hey, Jack, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This ain't your cat. This is my cat now. I thought it was a stray cat. So then after getting to know him for a couple of months, there was another cat too, which was the mother of that one. And we named her Missy's mom because one's Missy and the other one's Missy's mom. And the little Missy's mom is <laughs> this little black and white furry, this love bug, right? And we fell in love with her. So we started feeding him and feeding him. And before you know it, the neighbors are like, oh, yeah, we've been ha- we had him a couple of years, or the one for two years, one for a year. And we've been, be- and I'm starting to think, man, I just stole these people's cat. Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And now it's in my house. We don't even let him outside anymore because we love him. <laughs> <laughs> we, don't want, we don't want them to get killed. You know, there's a lot of coyotes and there, there's a lot of like in predators here and we love them so much that we don't want them to get eaten by something. So we decide we're going to keep them indoors and they love it indoors. But I know my neighbors like you guys, this is the I'll end the story on this note, which is the funniest part of it. Hmm. One day she got the one female got out the younger one, the little black one named Missy. And she ran off with a boy because you went in the heat and they get in heat. They're just, rawr, 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 and I got to go. Out. She saw this boy. We, this is a random straight cat. And she takes off and I don't see him, her for like a day and a half. So I started getting worried and I'm walking around my whole property. It's a quarter square mile. So it's seen you know, a lot of woods and I'm yelling, Missy, Missy, Missy. So I go over to the neighbor's house, knock on the door and keep in mind. They know my history. They might know my story, by the way. I had told them, you know, prison oh. and mafia and all that. And they think, dude, these people don't even have the internet. So there's like up north, middle of nowhere, middle American farmers. And then here I am. And they think I'm probably crazy anyways. And I got a big black Jeep and just freaking, you know, I look like I look. And all of a sudden I knock on the door. I'm like, have you guys seen Missy? Well, they call her Squirt. Have you seen Missy? <laughs> it's not the same name. <laughs> right. I, oh, I renamed her. Yeah. You just yeah. renamed <laughs> I, I took yeah. your cat and renamed it. I'm like, have yeah. you seen Missy? And they're like, the guy, the old man says, he's an old guy. He's like 75 years old. Real nice guy. He says, oh, yeah, she's, she's in the barn. I'm like, she got she with her boyfriend. She's like, oh, yeah, she's got that big Tomcat with her. I'm like, do you mind if I you know, go? I've been worried about her for a day and a half. I'm scared that something happened to her. Would you mind if I go in the barn and like pet her? Or she's, He's like, no, no, go ahead. And, and this is after they had told me they had been feeding them and kind of taking care of them for a couple of years or the one for a year and one for two. I went in the barn and found the cat, grabbed her, stuffed her under my arm like a football and like snuck back to my house. <laughs> <laughs> I basically, I just went. So if they looked out the window, they were like, this freaking guy is stealing our cat again. <laughs> they probably think you're obsessed with cats. <laughs> yeah, man. I think I'm a freaking weirdo. But so you know, that's the thing. A lot of people who like dogs think that cats have horrible personalities. No. But it, just, it depends on the cat. Exactly. Yep. Right. So my cat, cat. I, I took a lot of effort to get my cat. So what I did was I figured, you know, you can't predict a cat's future personality from when it's a kitten. So I was no. like, I can't get a kitten. So what I did was I went to a bunch of shelters. Then mm-hmm. I went to these cat cafes also. And I pet yeah. like 60, 70 cats. The one <laughs> cat that was the most friendly I adopted. Now, this cat's been yeah. with me for a couple of years. If I like uh, make a sound like this, the cat will come from another room. Yeah, straight yeah, to yeah. Me. And if the cat's doing something I don't like and I like do a little hissy noise to it, it'll yeah, stop do doing that. whatever it's doing. Totally. Yeah. So respectful, no, loves to cuddle. It's like a dog. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. You did yeah. the right thing. You're very pragmatic and, and intelligent type of thinking so that you did the right thing. I got lucky. You know, two, uh, two of my cats were already indoor. One is a giant male cat who's scared of everything. He's like a giant kitten. The other one is this very assertive female. Um, she's like the bitch of the whole crew. And then the other one's super, super playful. And the other one is just a snuggle bug. The little, she's tiny, by the way. She's a miniature cat. If you ever, I don't, I've never seen a cat like this in her life. She's like three pounds. She's, she's about one third the size of a normal cat. Wow. She's like having a perpetual kitten and she's super cute and snuggly and like makes these little song call, or noises. Like we call it honks. She goes, yeah. it's like, she's honking. She does it all the time. If you say something to her, like you don't miss these mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so funny man she's cute but anyways i'll get back to my uh you, your question which was um uh, the book you asked me about, uh, radio shows yeah so my new book is a political thriller which you are going to love it's it, so i'm oh, really yeah, gonna, i've heard about that one that was exciting yeah that one is gonna be it's very i think a lot of my readers and fan base are going to be shocked because it's really only the third book that I'll have published since I've been home from prison. And everybody, because I work in this mafia space, and I wrote a book, two books about a mafia family. And it's just kind of, I work in that space. They're all going to expect me. They don't realize that only two of my nine novels I wrote in prison are mafia based. But I, I, so I write all genres, whatever I enjoy, whatever inspires me. And this one, because of the political environment we're in, I decided to write this political thriller. It's called Blind Sight 2020. Mm. And it's basically it's basically told to the perspectives of like five different main characters. But there's one real main character and he's in prison. And it's an end time scenario where China decides um, they've had enough. We owe them one hundred trillion dollars. They want their money. We, they know we can't pay them. So they basically say, if you don't pay us um, in land, which we want California for its agriculture and we want um, Alaska for its oil, if you don't pay us. And then we were going to first we're going to do is cease all trade with you. And of course, you know, very bold Americans are like, oh, you won't do that because you rely on us. And he's like, no, we don't rely on you. So they're going to do what's called a hermetically sealed um, uh, economy, meaning they take this economy and, and rather than trade and rather than sell America all the goods that they normally sell, they're going to sell it to themselves. But people don't have money. Doesn't matter because in communist society, they just issue money. So basically, they give everybody like a quarter million dollars and say, you got 18 months to spend it. The only thing you can spend it on are the goods that you've been manufacturing for, for America. Everybody's sucks buying stuff and it's like happy. So this is one of their 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 ways to to dismantle the United States. And then they hit us with a cyber big cyber attack. Then they hit us with the EMP and um it kind of throws everything back into the dark ages. And the only option is a nuclear war. And, you know, they know that because they the, one of the main catalysts of the story is they have a cyber department, like this massive cyber team that had hacked into the military's like this DARPA mainframe and, and the CIA's mainframe. And what they were after was all of our own um, military war simulations. Mm -hmm. So once they they ran their own war simulations and concluded that if we attack them in this way, they have no contingency. So they wanted to make sure that they didn't have like America had a consent. So they stole all these things and find out America came to the same conclusion. If they hit us in this way, their only option would be nuclear war. And that's when they basically meet the president, President Biden, and yeah. say, listen, do you want to blow up the whole world? Do you want to kill the whole world over this? Or Because that's how it'll end in the nuclear war. You bomb, we bomb, we kill everybody. It doesn't end well for anybody. Or you can acquiesce, you know, and give us this land we want to help us further our empire, our growing economy and our growing population. And so anyways, this main one of the main characters is in prison. All he wants to do and when this all happens over like a freaking three week period, mm -hmm. everything goes into the dark ages. They're basically left to fend for themselves in prison and he breaks out of prison. He's trying to get home to his wife and a young guy like you, like you could perfectly, you would perfectly play that character, your mm -hmm. age, your look, a young guy, kind of muscular ex military, and he's got a wife and daughter that are 300 miles away up north. And she had been preparing them a little homestead, kind of like I got now. And he's going to try to get to her. But in right now, if, after the, the whole thing, um, the economy implodes and then the EMT and, the, and the, everybody's fighting and killing each other for what little resources are left. Mm. People don't get it. If suddenly the, the lights went off and there was no more water and there's no more food. Imagine what you got in your house. That's all you got to survive. Well, it ain't much. So what happens is. People immediately start after three, four days of starving. They start like taking what, what you know, and they start fighting and killing. So it, each has, other. it has a bit of a prepper 
kind of yeah uh, yeah oh yeah too which which is pretty cool yep. to mix those two i wanted to comment on two things gunner one interesting thing did you know that uh, after world war ii japan because japan was uh, humiliated in world war ii and destroyed economically mm. they went from being a destroyed nation to within 40 years the top economy in the world how they did that mm. many people don't know for the first 10 years or so they developed a hermetically sealed economy even though yes. they had they couldn't produce stuff but they were like screw yeah, it we'll yeah. starve or we produce everything ourselves opposite of yeah. what the America does right now. We depend on everybody. Exactly. You know what I mean? Second thing I wanted to mention is there's an amazing, wonderful short book called The Prisoner's Dilemma by William Poundstone. It's one of my favorite short books. And it's actually about that second strike capacity for nuclear warfare. And it's about the, how game theory affected the way the US and Israel and other countries plan their international relations. You might find it fun to like build that into the book also. But yeah, we're really, I'm really excited for this. I want to check it out when you put, how's your radio show going also? It's going good, man. It's growing really quickly. It's, um, you know, I get sponsors every week. One of the cool things I get, to, I try to have authors on every week. I'll have you on at some point. And um, every week I, I bring in a couple of authors or celebrities of, you know, what best I can get. And uh, like this week, I have Rob Van Dam, the wrestler is coming on, like the um, Hall of Fame, WWE Hall of Fame guy. He's a really interesting guy. He's now got his own line of CBD oils and um, um, uh, products. And he's is lots he of the guy that got removed for uh, marijuana use. And now he moved to Vegas and he has a cannabis company. Yeah, yeah, he's a really cool guy. That's great. Oh, awesome. Yeah, he smokes pot. I interviewed him for my YouTube show. And the whole time he was smoking a joint it was funny. <laughs> Yeah, he likes but, that. <laughs> yeah, he loves the weed. But I mean, so that's who I am this week. And I had this other author who I'm talking to. I'm trying to trying to arrange it so she can come on. But she wrote a book. I can't remember the name of it, but they made a movie out of it. And Sigour Sigourney Weaver uh, starred in it. So so I'm just trying to get people like that who have interesting stories, man. That's what I'm about. Like, I'm. Um, in my YouTube show, even I'm phasing away from all things mafia. And okay, so the, that's that's a great segue because I wanted to ask you about that. And I want to tell the listeners something. <clears throat> So your channel has sort of fallen into this niche in YouTube, which is like this mafia channel niche. Mm -hmm. But the difference between you and other other guys in that niche is you love telling stories, not just your own stories. You're a genuine storyteller. Yeah. You like to write books. And so you're generally looking for stories. But this, it's interesting. The other mafia channels are either they're doing either one of two things, either telling stories about their glory days, which mm -hmm. gets views or trying to teach lessons, which doesn't get views. So they try no. to balance between the two yeah. and different channels do it to a different degree. And I'm glad you're being able to branch out a little bit from that because you provide so much more than just that, just yeah. that subject, although that subject's interesting, of course, but that brings us to the topic, which we wanted to discuss on this, uh, on this video, which is a, like an interesting, amusing topic. So the last time I was paying attention to the, the mafia YouTube world, things were quite okay. Uh, Sammy, uh, Francisi was nice to Sammy Gravano. Everybody was nice to each other. You all were getting to know each other. I checked back in six months later and it's mayhem. So I, I need you to explain like briefly. So this is what I noticed. Okay. These are my, my, what I noticed. Number one, first I noticed that Sammy Gravano and Francesi are saying nice things about each other. Then Sammy flips on Francesi, Francesi responds, but then more things happen. Some guy out of a street called Bath Street. I don't even know yeah, what that Bath is. Bath Avenue appears on Sammy's channel. I didn't register. It happened months before I saw that. Then he has his own channel, starts talking about Larry Mazza, a friend of yours, and then John A. Light. And, and so there's a lot, what is going on? Is this all Sammy? Here's the thing. So I, I, I could spend, I might as well talk about Sammy the Bull briefly. So I don't know if I told you this, but Sammy the Bull's camp reached out to me six, eight, nine months ago, um, whatever it was said they're doing a podcast and they need someone to write the uh, the outline because Sammy's getting up in age and is, um, he's kind of a difficult time remembering the details. And they said, like, you're you know the best, supposed to be the best mafia writer in the world who recreates this stuff in a way that nobody else can. And I said, yeah. He said, well, we got one writer. The one writer tried. She was Mark Wahlberg because Mark Wahlberg was in 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 involved in helping him sell his podcast to Spotify. He was trying to get a big deal, million dollar deal. And he, they wanted the movie rights. He said, no, they said, yes, they were battling. And this is when it took place. So he has Mark Wahlberg's writer, this woman try to write the outline for it. And they didn't like it. He said, it's, this is bullshit. This doesn't represent, you know, this well. And so they were getting another writer. And then I, somebody suggested me two, three, four guys all suggested me. So we talked on Facebook messenger, but we, called each other and he said this is what so i ended up doing a zoom call with him mm. and i still have that zoom call 
And, and I, he basically said, yeah, I'm getting up in age, you know, I'm trying to recall these stories and just going to the details. And he's got a teleprompter and all this stuff when he's. Oh, you know, I was they wondering, gotta, by the way, because his stories are so professionally done. I was always like, yeah, this guy's talented, man. I wish I had the talent of him. Like, he yeah, puts jokes in there. They're perfectly timed. How did it's it's, a, he's, he's got a team? So he's okay. He's got a mastermind behind this. His name is Richard Miller, Richie Miller. This oh. guy is smart, very smart, very good. I like him a lot. I mean, I wish I had a, a Richie Miller in my life. This guy was a, is a beast. So all these guys, there's like four or five guys have been working with Sammy for like a year and a half to try and get this podcast up and sold and all this stuff. And that's when I came along and I said, you know, I can do this. So they said, well, you can compete with the other writers, see who's better. I, that's what I suggested. I said, let's do a contest. I'll write two outlines. He writes two outlines. We'll see what happens. I know what will happen. So I write it and I send it to him over, email it over. Like 20 minutes later, he they, they call me like, dude, you are the freaking truth at this. Like, OK, you're the man. And I said, all right, cool. So here's the deal. You know, I'm only going to charge you 500 bucks an episode. It's not very much, you know, but, you know, it takes me it takes me a day to do this, you know, to make it very. Di- so I do a long version and a short version. He can kind of pick which one he wants. Mm-hmm. And they were like this. Richie says, well, listen, I have to apologize, Gunner. You know, we really aren't in a position right now financially to be paying any. We, you know, we, we will when we are. We'll let you know. And um. But, you know, he, right now he's like, we've been all working on spec for, for, we haven't got paid anything for a year and a half. There's like five of us involved. Nobody's been paid. So I said, yeah, okay, that's no problem, bro. You know, I, I could appreciate that. Not worried at all. But, you know, I'm just saying my time is not free. Unfortunately, I'm busy. I got to pay the bills. So when you guys are ready, just let me know. And I'll, you know, if you want me to write, I will. So that was that. We said, okay, great. You know, after a Zoom call. And then you know, I, I tried to stay in contact with them over the next couple of um weeks and i sent him a couple messages i see he got him but he he didn't answer him that's kind of a douchey thing to do not answer but because after i did all this work for you for free and then and then anyways then at one point well i'll get to that in the show they end up doing his show he started his show and he was like telling he's like really glamorous stories that are further on his career and i wrote him and said hey do yourself a favor bro go back to the beginning go back to the very beginning when you were just a street thug just a freaking nobody this the, the grimy gritty stuff that you did is good and literally the next day the next yeah. day he went on the, he went on the next day he made a lot of videos about the uh, ramblers or the what are those guys rampers, the rampers yeah the rampers yeah is that you your so, advice oh yeah because literally oh. the next day he went on there he says Listen, so you guys have been talking about maybe I should start back. About, and like next day he started. I'm like, yeah, I did that. Oh, cool. But 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 anyway, so he doesn't call me back. So now I'm going to go on uh, National Crime Syndicate with Sonova Cantrell to do a True Crime Tuesdays. And so we pick a topic and she's like, pick a topic. I'm like, yeah, let's just go with a little bit. So pick Sammy. So pick Sammy. I, I, I text him I'd be a messenger. And I said, listen, I'm doing this show. It's a live thing. Is there anything you want me to say or don't want me to say? You want to promote anything? What do you want me to do? I'm just letting you know. Heads up. You're the freaking topic. Yeah. Nah. Well, I see he gets it, but he don't answer. So I go on there and I tell the truth. I basically say, yeah, Sammy, you know, wanted to hire me to do this, but his Spotify deal fell through um, and uh, the Mark Wahlberg camp backed out. I, so I said, so, you know, I said some things. And then I said he needed me to write, you know, these outlines to help him kind of spark his memory when he's telling the stories. So then I, I, I don't hear nothing from him. About a few days go by and I get a call from him, but it's on his cell phone now. So I must have gave him my number. It it's, it's pops up, Sammy the Bull. And um, so I'm deer hunting. I'm in my tree stand. I look at my phone. Sammy the Bull's calling, but I can't answer it because I'm on in my tree stand deer hunting. So I just say, you know, shove it back in my phone. I'll get back later. So when I go back later, he left a message on a voicemail and he said, what's up, Gunner? You know, it's Sammy. Just here's my number, man. You, you know, give me a call. But don't use it too often or something like that. And I'm like, <laughs> right. I was like, I'm sitting there looking at this. I go, does this guy think I'm some kind of groupie or something? He must think I'm some kind of fanboy or something. Don't use it too often. Like I give a shit about Sammy the Bull. Like I would give it like, what? I mean, dude, I'm like, bro, you're nobody to me. I don't care, bro. Just listen, I, I, I'm cordial and nice with you or whatever. But at the end, the end of the day, you're like a weaselly, ratty old man. I mean, I don't you care. Have, you you, know, you don't pay my bills. One of those mafia fanboys type things. <laughs> yes, exactly. So no, but he said him and Rich Miller told me later that that wasn't the case because now I call him. I don't call. Him. I said I'm not even gonna call this freaking guy. I wait like two weeks and I call him. You know, out of the blue, and he's like, "What's up, man? I saw that video, uh, that show, man. You, you know, you made me look like I'm some kind of feeble old man." I was like, "What?" 
I said, bro, what are you talking about? I said, I told the truth. What you told me, you were having a hard time remembering and you wanted me to write this. So I did. I said, that's it. He's like, well, he's like, hey, well, why'd you talk about the Spotify thing? I'm like, bro, everybody knew. He's like, no, they didn't. I'm like, listen, I had like five people who work in the industry call me within a two day period and say, Sammy's Spotify deal fell through. So I assumed you guys made it public and went out there and Facebook or YouTube or whatever said his deal fell through. So I just brought it up in this thing. I'm like, which I actually defended him. I said, yeah, I get why. If they wanted the film rights, he should keep his film rights. I don't blame him for saying F you. I want my film rights. But they were saying, if we get you a movie deal out of this, it's ours. So I didn't, that was that. And then what else did he say? He's like, and then the Mark Wahlberg thing. And I was like, bro, that's just, you told me about this. I asked you, is there anything you want me to say or not say? You didn't even message me back. Didn't even give me the common courtesy. That I said, then you send me a message and says, don't delete, here's my number, but don't use it too often. Like I'm some kind of fanboy. <laughs> and, and, and he's like, all right, well, I got a call coming in. He's like, I got a meeting. I, I'm done with this conversation. I say, yeah, right, good luck, man. Me too. And that was it. So then I got, no, so then Fox News, uh, Eric Sean from Fox News flew me down to Detroit to appear on this Hoffa documentary. And, and also when I was talking to Fox, Eric Sean, he brought up this potential show called Wise Guys. He's like, you, Sammy the Bull, maybe a couple of other guys like Franzese or Maza. And he's like, you know, I think it's great. The guy pitched it to the heads of Fox the very next day. Mm. So I'm on the set and the producer says, yeah, he pitched it to so-and-so yesterday. So I had texted Rich Miller. I said, listen, I know Sammy and Francis are not like the best of friends, but if we get this show, you guys cool with doing it. And Miller calls me back. I'm, le- I'm coming from the airport. And he's like, yeah, 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 man. He's like, no, we got no problem with Michael Francis or you. And he's, that's when he tells me, he's like, you know, Sarah, I, is Sammy mad at me or something? He's like, well, he wasn't happy. He wasn't too happy. You didn't edify him properly and i said edify him he's like well you know he's kind of an old guy and stuck in his ways he has like an ego we all have to work around. i said stop i said rich listen i'm freaking sammy is this an old man to me he works in entertainment i work in entertainment in the street he was a gangster and a shooter it's the same as me i did my time never cooperated i don't have to bow down to him or anyone else and rich was like no no Al, i'm not saying you should bow down to anybody i'm like listen i'm not pandering to nobody's freaking sensitive ego especially um old you're, man you're just can't. like me by the way about because because this is not a business to you it's your life you love what hey. you do so yeah. you're not gonna go bend over backwards and hurt your ego you love it that's why you're doing it not for money yeah. And I don't do it. I don't I mean I do it for money in some regards, but I'm not going to kiss nobody's ass. But your goal like, isn't like to maximize money overall else. No, no, no. no. And it's Sammy is life. the Sammy is the guy who he he like interrupted me a few times. He says, "Listen, you got to stop talking. Let me talk." And I'm just like, "Okay, Sammy, tell me what you want." But if I have something something that's important to say, I want to interrupt you, and I'm going to say it. He's under the impression that everybody should shut up when Sammy talks. Everybody should listen and everybody should kiss his ass. I'm like, bro, I know you got a bunch of freaking yes men around you who are all freaking banking that. Hopefully you're going to be. I don't give a shit about you. In my mind, here's how I think. You are an old man. I could slap the shit out of him in two <laughs> seconds. You ain't a gangster. You ain't going to shoot me. You ain't going to kill me. Your gangster years are over, bro. And, and like as far as your gangster card goes, you can tell your little stories and all that. But your gangster card got stripped when he took the stand against 67 guys. All right. So other than that, I said, now we work in entertainment. We're here to entertain people. Whatever. I'm not going to kiss his ass. And I'm having this conversation with Rich Miller. And he was really nice about it. Really cool. And he did say, you know, he's got no problem. And Sammy wished me a happy birthday. I got a text on my phone on, on I mean, on Christmas, a happy Christmas, Merry Christmas. And I've talked to Rich Miller. We had a two hour call about a month ago. And so I got, I'm just saying they all kiss his ass because they're all like banking on him, making the money. I don't have to kiss his ass. He will never play a part in my life. He did say he wanted to buy out my apparel company because his show is called Our Thing. Really? And I, and I own Our Thing. I said, yeah. He said, yeah, maybe I'll buy you out. <laughs> 60%. I said, well, you better come with a big check, Sammy, because I'm not giving it away. You know what I'm okay. saying? Because, you know, I'm sure I'm sure if he, if I didn't own Our Thing Apparel, that would be the name of his apparel. But he's got the bullpen or something like that. And how, how did you him. flip on Francisi? Has he already flipped on him by that so, time? They had some kind of this, this some kind of conflict, right? But I don't know what happened there. How it got? I had talked to Rich Miller a couple times, and he said we have no problem working with Francisi. And I said, you know, anybody else here? Mazo, you good with that? He's like, well, I'm good with it. I'm like, we're all good with it. So this is what happened. So, so here's what happened, and this is a good 
piece of information that a lot of people probably don't know who might be listening. He, Sammy started his podcast called The Bullpen, which is a new thing. And they, they actually talked about having me on as one of the hosts and producers of it. Mm. And that's what he said. Rich Miller said, I'd like to have you. But they can't afford me because I'm not doing it for free. They want people to work for free. Mm. You know, if I'm the producer, I got to go down to Vegas once a month and record for a week straight. That's five grand or something. You know what I'm saying? I'm not doing it for peanuts. Otherwise, good luck. And so he was looking for people that be on his show. And he asked Larry to come on his show. And him and Larry are cool. They're cordial. In fact, Sammy is the consultant for a project that Larry was originally part of about um, the um, Mississippi burning case with Greg Scarpa. Mm. And he was originally, Larry was the main guy who I hooked him up. Scott Bernstein was writing the source material for it. My friend Scott Bernstein and my co-host on my show. Mm. And then I said, why don't we get Larry involved? I mean, he's the perfect guy. He's like, yeah, give me his numbers. And I called and hooked up. The producer said, all right, we want you in, yada, yada, yada. But at about the same time, Larry got a, his book option by a big shot producer named Joe Paletto, some billionaire. Mm-hmm. And so the old Paletto said, now you only can do this one, not both. And he should have told him, listen, Joe, I was already obligated. I don't do both, but he didn't. He said, you can only do this one. So now they need a consultant with some inside knowledge of the knob. So they hired Sammy. So they got Sammy in there. And so they're all, they're cool. We all cordially talk. In fact, Larry called him and said, what's going on with me? You and my buddy Gunner, you know, you're good. And Sammy's like, Oh no, we're good. He just freaking said a couple of things that, he shouldn't have said and whatever. So now he asked Sammy asked him to come on with a guy named Jimmy Calandra. Mm. And J- Jimmy Calandra is, is this dude. He's kind of this, uh, you know, it's kind of slow he's from Bath Avenue, hung around a bunch of like a bunch of bad kids that were kind of lackeys in the neighborhood for a couple of wise guys. You know, yeah. run around, go get me this, run that, pick up my money, pick up that, get my yeah. laundry, blah, 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 stuff like that. And they were bad kids. They wanted to be gangsters so bad, you know, and, they, and then at some point they robbed uh, in a, during a robbery. He, um, uh, they killed a woman, which is you know mm-hmm. horrible, hor- horrific. And then they uh, he ends up going to prison for a bank robbery. I think he was stealing like P.O. boxes, breaking into P.O. boxes. And he goes to prison for that. And I don't remember why he flipped because I don't really know the story, but he did. He, Jim mm-hmm. Calandra flipped at age 22. He flipped. And then at he 22. So, Holy yeah. God, the guy flipped maybe 23. Me. Wait, yeah, yeah. So he, so many that damn stories from this Bath Avenue. If he was 23 when he flipped. Yeah, exactly. I was thinking, Dude, these stories are exactly. like kids stories. I was, yeah, yeah anyway. exactly. So, so, I mean, you can do a lot from, you know, from age 15 to 23, but I think he's aggregating a lot of stories and kind of embellishing or whatever. You know, just like today did a show. I had to see it. And it was like he was talking about everybody he was in prison with. But he didn't have any stories about it. He was like, I was in prison with all these guys. I'm like, yeah, bro, I was in prison with a thousand freaking gangsters and killers and dope men. Uh, it doesn't mean I was hanging out with them or doing dirt with them. Or, uh, just because uh, you met them in prison don't mean nothing. Like, that's kind of what I'm saying. So he's telling all these stories. And at some point, at some point he says, um, I happened to see his show because it gets suggested to me. And I, I messaged him. I emailed him. I said, hey, man, would you?" because I got his email from a friend of mine. And um, I said, this guy's name Anthony Vitale, a Detroit guy. He's obsessed with all things mafia, too. Mm-hmm. And his family's kind of connect, kind of connected, but he's not. Mm-hmm. And he says, I got Jimmy's uh, phone number and email. I'll give it to you. So I, I said, hey, man, would you like to come on my show? And he says, listen, this is exactly what he says. He's like, listen, Gunner, Gunner, I know you're as real as they come. He's like, but some of them guys in your show, not so much. You know, the rats. And I said, listen, I get it, bro. I mean, but I'm not a rat. I said, and I'm just hosting a show. Well, I just give, I, I give. Yeah, I know. That's what I was thinking. I didn't even know he was a rat at, <laughs> at the time. At the time, I didn't even know he was a rat. Uh-huh. You know so I didn't, I didn't even know. And I said, listen, these guys come to my show. I give them a platform to share their stories. There's a market for it. A lot of people are going to hear the stories and I give it to them. You know, Larry's my friend. I just said about that. And like, Larry's a good friend with other guys. I don't know or care. I don't research them. I just know them. they got a mob story and p- kids want to hear it. So he's like, ah, I have to respectfully decline. I said, okay, great, man, no problem. If you ever want to come on, let me know. We happen to have you on. Now, now to me, this guy is nobody. And I tell you why. Four years ago, when I published my book, when I first published my book, which by the way, I have the original first copy of my book, the first number one book with a limited edition cover. Yeah, now, I like it's, that that, cover. That, now it's that cover color. Yeah. But, but anyways, he messaged me on messenger i don't know who he is he friend requests me he sees that i'm promoting this book and it's doing well i'm getting you know hundreds and hundreds of likes on facebook and everybody's like oh i love the book so he messaged me and he says i'm writing a book too and i wrote back yeah what about bath avenue Mm -hmm. means nothing to me i don't know what bath avenue is Mm -hmm. i'm like 
<laughs> I said, well, well, good luck, dude. That's all I, I do. Why, why, can I come? Why do these guys talk about Bath Avenue like it's like it's something everybody's supposed to know about around the world? Right. I exactly. have no idea. He keeps saying there's no a Bath, Bath Avenue story. I don't know what yeah. that is, dude. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. like me saying Gratiot Avenue in Detroit. I know. Well, it's like me Gratiot mentioning Avenue. a street in Dubai, Gasleys or something that nobody knows about. Right, right. <laughs> How's I don't know what the hell Bath Avenue or care. So yeah. I wished him luck. I said, God bless you, man. Good luck. That's it. And then I, I stay. He's one of my 5,000 Facebook friends. And every once in a while, one of his posts would pop up. But I never saw a book. Never saw nothing. I never saw. I'm like, yeah, what happened to his book? Thought he's writing a book. Whatever. And then I see his little show that he did. I didn't even know he'd been on Sammy's show. I had no idea. I just see his little goofy kind of video that he made. It's like he got the phone turned the wrong way and it's just a cheap kind of just half ass just a recording with his phone, which is cool. He told a pretty good story. It wasn't bad. It's, it's entertaining. So I said, oh, God bless him, man. Good luck. You know, that was pretty good. I don't know nothing about his story. Nothing. I kind of I still don't know a lot. I just know at 22, he, he, rat, he ratted when he was 22 and burned his, his old crew that all turned out to be junkies and dope fiends and yeah. losers and so that's but, it. Gunner, do you ever notice something just as a fellow video maker? When you watched his, I don't know if this right or, or not, but when you watch his stuff, do you notice that like, like you said, it's goofy and all that kind of stuff, but his lines are really good. They seem almost planned. Like the 10 minute segments, they're almost like Sammy's. Like they go really well. Yeah. Like yours, well, he's watching you Sammy's. go off on a tangent, you go this way. There's, it always stays certain minutes. <laughs> and it's always. Well, well, here's the thing. So there's a sweet spot. On you, like all the producers and everybody knows the sweet spot is 10 to 20 minutes, 10 to 22 minutes. I don't care. I'll go on. I'll go on a tangent for freaking an hour straight. And the other thing is, while I'm telling a story, I'm not playing nothing. I'm like, this is a story that happened in my mind. I'll sit down and start talking. But in the middle of that story, I'm like, damn. I'm, so this reminds me what happened yeah, before this. Yeah. And I'll go on a side story for five or 10 minutes. Then I'll get back to the original story. And so I might do that two or three times. It drives some people crazy. But no, some people that's like, oh, true. The weird yeah, thing is that he doesn't exactly. do that, which makes me think no. he's writing it for him. But I don't know. I don't know if it's true. Anyway, so you were saying you were watching his stuff. You didn't know he was on Sammy's thing yet. Now, no, nothing. Is it that he first denied something a -Light said was true? Is that how it started? He said, I didn't slap some guy well, in jail. I'm going to get that to that in a second. And, I, and yeah. so I'm going to get the first two. What happened with Sammy? Sammy invited Larry on and he said, you're going to come on with this kid, Jimmy Calandra, who said Larry didn't know, had never heard of, had no idea who he was. And, but he's supposedly, he was good. So he's trying to get mob guys to come on this show, the bullpen. That's what he's trying to do. Anybody in the mob, they're trying to. So I, I, I was told that he asked somebody else and they turned him down because they didn't want to be associated with Sammy the bull because his, you know, he's a rat too. And so Larry who's friends with them. It's like, you know, he just said, if that kid Calandra is a scumbag, he killed a woman on top of that. He like, we tried to help him when we got, I have a friend named Sal and we, and when he got out of prison, he's like, we tried to help him. We hooked him with our friend Sal. He was a junkie. So he had nowhere to live. We got him a place to stay with my friend Sal. And then while Sal was at work, he tried to freaking uh, Sal's wife. He's like, Oh, he sales. Oh, yeah, got him out of there before he killed him. Then they hook him up with another guy and a job. So now the guy does it again, tries to bang somebody else's girl. And then when it don't happen, he lies and tells the streets that he banged her. So now he's a scumbag. <laughs> and Larry's like, like, Larry's like, listen, man, sorry, Sammy. Oh Thanks God. for the offer. Thanks for the offer. But I'm not interested in going on a show with this dude. I won't feel comfortable. Now, Larry is an absolute gentleman. He's an, a super sweet guy. And he, I'm sure he was super, is polite about it. He said, listen, Sammy, I'd love to come on your show. But unfortunately, we have to decline. I just won't feel comfortable you know, being in a room with this guy. He's a douchebag. I'm loyal to my friend, Sal, who's a good friend of mine and whatever. whatever. So, Sam, so now this is where it starts to go wrong. I think Sammy felt slighted. Sammy felt like, you know, who are you to not you know, deny to come on my show, which is the second person who denied to come on a show. So he's looking for mob guys with names, but nobody wants to because, listen, I told that to Eric Sean at Fox News, dude. I said, OK, so this is how it could work. It could go either way with, with Sammy the Bull. Half the world hates him. Half the world loves him. The problem is you're out of New York and New York based, um, you know, television network. Oh, there's are millions of people who hate Sammy the Bull. Because he ratted on John Gotti and took down freaking all, all the families. So do you want to put him center stage on a, on a network show? I don't know. Could go either way. Well, either way. So now this is when Calandra, who somebody says, you know, because he's got a bunch of little dick riding wiener, like weasels that, that like worship him, which is weird. Because I'm like, just because he tells these, these funny. Listen, if my, if my stories were New York based, bro, I'd have a million subscribers. 
because yes, I'm from Detroit. Yeah, I know. If I was because I'm from Detroit, nobody cares. Nobody wants to listen. Ah, oh, it's Detroit. It's bullshit. But my stories are are top notch and super entertaining. Even though the, the, the Detroit, the Detroit you grew up in was far more dangerous than the area they were far around more, in New York. Far yeah. more, far more, and even the Detroit mafia, their family, Detroit family, is far more comprehensive and effective than any one New York family together makes way more money has way more power has way more influence. And now people will say, Oh, this bullshit. I'm like, do your freaking homework. Listen, the, the boss died after 40 years on the throne worth over a hundred million dollars, ran everything from the judges. To, he had FBI's in pocket, politicians, everybody, the whole family. So mm-hmm. yes, there's only like 40 made guys. Yes. Each made guy's got you know, his crew of eight, 10 guys. And each one of those 10 guys got, you know, guys like me. At the end of the day, they control every racket, gambling, drugs, prostitution, nightclubs, porn, da, 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 and they do it so effectively. So when a made guy kicks an envelope up, up to the boss in Detroit, it's not $200 like these guys in New York. It's like, here's my tribute for the week, boss, Skipper, $200, $50, dollars it's all I got. They're, put, they're handing them envelopes for $200,000. And this it's weekly, monthly. So, you know, that's that's the difference. So and like I said, if I had a, if my if my stories are good, but if they were like New York based, they would be flocking to it because they're not. They don't. So that's all. Jimmy Calandra got his little base of like New York mob groupie minions. Mm. And so they're all on his dick. And so now his channel kind of blows up a little bit. You know, he gets like 10, 12,000 subscribers really fast. So now he's feeling on top of the world. Now he feels like he's a big shot. I was on Sammy the Bull show. You know, and I got 10,000 subscribers. So he basically calls out Larry. This is the point where he says, Larry Mazza wasn't made. This is what somebody told me. Or that guy. He acted like he was firsthand knowledge that Larry Mazza wasn't made. Keep in mind how ridiculous this sounds. And I said this on a video when we rebuked him. Now, I didn't attack him or nothing. I simply said, it's absurd. The notion is absurd for me to, that a Bonanno associate, low-level street kid, child, a street kid, low level one associate from another family could ever say definitively that a highest level Colombo guy was or was not made. Yeah. The other thing is he doesn't, unless he has someone in his ear saying, telling him to tell things. Well, exactly. Yeah. No, no, it's exactly what it is. It's mm-hmm. this. Now that could have been Sammy. Yeah, it could have been. Right. So, so, and Larry believes that, you know, but Larry, Larry's like, he, really, so maybe Sammy got mad that Larry went to his show. And he's like, he's not even a made freaking guy. And, blah, blah. and then Sam, there's more oh. to it. Let well, me tell you. The- well, just just for the audience to know, I mean, for the guys that haven't listened to Jimmy Calandra, I'm not trying to b- badmouth him or anything. I mean, I'm sure he had an interesting life. But yeah, when yeah. you hear his stories, you can tell this guy was not violent. He was not aggressive. No. He was not a no. leader. He was never uh, intense. Turner. He was just a lackey. All his stories are, I hung around this guy. He slapped me. I laughed and like shit like that, you know, genuine yeah. lackey. So. So that's why it's so interesting. He's become sort of the mouthpiece or potential tool for Sammy, we think, maybe, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So there's a, uh, this is, a, I'm going to tell you something that nobody else knows on here. And I probably shouldn't, but I will. Sammy got a deal with Joe Paletto, the same producer that optioned Larry's book to make a multi million dollar TV series, Joe's book, uh, Larry's Book of Life. Well, they did it. They spent several months making the podcast and po- editing it and doing it, you know, high level, We're talking 10, 12, $15,000 an episode or more. And he had given Sammy some money, a bunch of money. And then when the, the production came, was finished, Sammy didn't like it. And the Joe was like, no, I like it. It's love it. Leave, leave it just like this. And Sammy's like, nah, I don't like it. Now this is where I can defend him. If you, I get it, Sammy, if the guy, if you don't like your finished product, it's your name, your career, your life on the line. If you think it's shit, there's this guy, Rich Miller, who's brilliant. I mean, brilliant, just an amazing guy, like one in a million, brilliant producer, director, writer, um, all things. He's everything. He's the guy's a G and he said it sucks. He's like, he's like, Al, let me just tell you something, man. The, it was just shit. The guy wanted to put shit out there and Sammy's like, I'm not going to, so he backed out of it. He says, I forget it, man. I don't want to do it. So the guy was like, yo, you owe me money. I gave you money and, and all this money you put into production. You, I want it back. So that's when Sammy decided to go live with his, with his with his YouTube channel and start monetizing it. He just did it on his own without the back end of like it got an Amazon deal, I think, but it wasn't I probably was no money. You know what I mean? But now he's just making money from advertising and YouTube, whatever. And then he said, I ain't make money from merch and maybe some Patreons or whatever. So you gotta raise his money to pay back Joe Paletto, otherwise it's gonna go to the lawyers. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so keep in mind, this producer who's freaking he got in a big beef with 
is the same producer that Larry's that's making Larry's book a TV series. Mm. So there is this conflict between them, you know, and Larry's on the side of Joe. He's his champion of Joe. Joe loves Larry. Yada, yada. Joe does not like Sammy anymore. Sammy does not like Joe anymore. So I could see there's this kind of this conflict between the two of them. But Larry is a professional. He's a super nice guy. He's a super sweetheart. And he's just trying to get his like, get it going. Larry he's makes a ton of money. Uh, yeah. The difference between. Is. Yes. The difference between Larry and Sammy is Larry don't need the money. Larry's a baller. Mm-hmm. He's, he's a sports handicapper for a big, you know, offshore place. The guy makes money. I mean, huge money. I mean, he's got everything. He's got a frick brand new Corvette in the garage. Couple, he's got like three cars. I think he's got a freaking like a, a Bentley or something too. He's, he's just a baller, you know, and he's super professional. He works out really hard. He's in great shape. He's an amazing wife. Kelly's incredibly smart and, and, and effective woman. And he's just happy. So Sammy, on the other hand, he knows he's old. He's could die any day. He's got a kind of feeble old man. He's not the healthiest guy. So I think that kind of had it created some, some unrest between them. So now I'll get to the Calandria thing. Yeah. So at some point, Calandria decides he's going to say that Larry wasn't made and Larry's lying about this or lying about that. Yeah. And it gets back. Well, I, I see it because I, I usually don't even watch any of this guy's stuff ever, but it came up in suggestions because he was getting it, so many It's happening hits. to me too. Yeah. They're really getting suggested a lot. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's how I saw it too. Yeah. Because of the comments and, and everything. Yeah. So I see it and I, and he says, it said something like Mazas never been made or whatever. And I listened to it. I'm like, this guy's freaking out of his mind. He's trying to say a low level 20 year old associate for the banana family. He's going to try to tell the world that a high level at the highest level guy, Larry Mazza, Greg Scarpa's right hand, you know, and, and junior Persico's freaking muscle wasn't made. So I said, Larry, would you like to come on my show? Cause he's my co-host. He's like my, we do, a, we do a show about once a week. And I said, would you like to come on and address this? He says, yes, he's mad. So he comes on there and he's a professional and the guys, uh, like you said, he's a class act and everything he does. And he just said, listen, I don't even know this freaking guy. I was in prison with him for 30 years ago. He was just some little wannabe, you know, punk running around the prison, like doing people's laundry and cooking food for us and stuff. I didn't know who he was. I was nice to him. Of course, I'm nice to him. I'm nice to everybody. He's like, but I was, I don't know. I didn't hang out or do it or nothing. It was just some little punk lackey. You know, that's it. You know, and so all, basically all the mob guys I said, run my errands and do my laundry and cook my cookups and blah, 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 get my coffee, get my chair. And that's what he did because that's what he was. He was a lackey and a wannabe. So that he was like, oh, my God, I'm in here with the big shot. So now Larry lets him have it. Which is actually funny, by the way, because the big shots there are actually under protection. And none of those yeah. guys can fend for themselves at all. And oh, of course. Of whatsoever. Course. That, that's the difference between me and all of them. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. And Sammy. Sammy brings up sometimes this story on his thing. He's like, I went to a phone one day and this black guy was on the phone and he wouldn't let me take the phone. I told him, hey, you could you could hit me, but I'm going to get you in the middle of the night. Dude, first of all, how are you going to get a guy in the middle of the night when he's sleeping in his cell locked up? Because I, I've actually slipped into cells before. You could put gum and try yeah, to stop yeah, yeah. I don't I've think he it. was doing that. And the second he thing is, he was, insecure, he was in Witsec. That yeah. guy was a rat, the black guy too. You're both rats and you're not beating up the guy. You know, it's, anyway, yeah. sorry. Exa- they both exaggerated. Yeah, he's not going to do nothing like that. See, the, Sammy in that, in that real world environment wouldn't do nothing. He's just a little old man who gets the shit kicked out of him. That guy, you got no pull in here, Sammy, man. You got, you got no yeah. They beat his ass good. like it's nothing. They don't care. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, me, I walked the yard 13 years by myself. No gang, no nothing. I didn't throw my weight around, but people knew who I was from the street. Every prison I went to, I was in eight different prisons over 13 years. And everywhere I went, everywhere, like almost the second I stepped out the bus, there's somebody who knows me from the street, not just from prison, but the street. And right away, they, they start, you know, it's a rumor mill. Prison's a rumor mill. And they walk on, they're like, you know who this guy is? This guy freaking, yeah. you know, oh, this guy's this guy. Everything about you before you get there. Yeah, yeah. Before I'm even in the unit, yeah, the yeah, freaking yeah. 800 guys on the yard already know that this freaking my, wise guy, tough guy, gangster just hit the yard and this is what he looks like and that's who he was with and yada 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 so i mean i and and a lot of the blacks and the muslims they don't give a shit about none of that but they do they think from a predatory standpoint they don't prey on the strong they prey on the weak exactly they sense weakness you can feel weakness in those places you can smell it and they they prey on the weak and i don't care how tough these guys are i i basically i basically punked the biggest and toughest black dudes in prison not like I was trying to be gangster, but like I one time I pissed off this guy really bad and he's like, I'm going to smash that freaking toaster because I got a thing stuck in it. I'm like, yeah, go ahead, bro. I don't care. For, do what you're going to do, man. I don't care. It's your toaster. I go home in two years. You're in it for life. And he walks over to the box. Did you hear this guy? You hear this guy? I'm telling you, I'm going to do something, man. I'm going to knock this. Man. I said, yo, I'm over here, bro. 
You want to say that right here? Come back over here. He didn't. And another time I walked into a cell. They moved me into a cell because they needed my bottom bunk. A guy had a bottom bunk detail. And I, I said, where are we moving? They're like, upstairs, a big Flint. Big Flint was the biggest guy in the joint in the prison. He's a huge black, dark skin, black, black as his shirt. Head like a freaking like a like a pumpkin. Huge. The guy don't even work out barely and he can bench like 550. And just one of them guys, you know. I'm not even joking. I seen him do it. I seen him put 500 on and rep it a couple of times. And I don't know if he's a dick. I don't know if he's racist. I don't know, but he is like one of the heads of the nation of Islam. So he's like oh, yeah. one of their top dogs. He's the one who wears the chicken bucket hat and the bow tie when they go to do their movie Definitely. or their uh, meetings. So I, I go up there. I pack my stuff and he's sitting on a bunk. He's got a bottom bunk and I walk in and I drop my duffel bag down and I look at the dude and say, Listen, man, I type all day. I'm a writer. I don't I don't play the yard much. I go work out. I come back. I'm on my typewriter. I write all freaking day long. I don't print all day. I only print once a day, usually on average. It takes about an hour. I said I don't print past like eight o'clock at night out of respect. Um, but I do I do lay on my bunk up there all night. And that's all day. It's what I do. And I don't, you know, I don't use drugs, gamble, nothing like that. I'm not in the day, day room playing cards. This is what I do. I write books. That's what I'm doing. If that's gonna bother you, bro, and we're gonna end up getting in a fight anyways then what I'm going to offer you now out of respect is that you just pack your stuff up right now. And then we can just, we can just bang out in here, bro. At least when, at least you'll pack your stuff up and the cops will break stuff and lose stuff and, and whatever. Cause when that's the a cops very daring up, way to say it. That's a very daring way. Usually yeah, you ask the guy for a head up and whoever loses packs his stuff up and gets out. But you were like, pack your stuff up already and get, get ready for we're the both fight. going to the hole. No, it wasn't even <laughs> like that. I said, I wasn't saying we're, we're both going to end oh, up in the hole, oh, bro. It's going to be blood. So it's oh. going to be a bloodbath in there, bro. There's no oh. way two guys like us are going to fight. It's there. They're going to hear us. The, the, the base was only freaking like six cells down and down the stairs. We're going to be in there just like boom, boom, boom. some places, some places the guards will walk by you. Your face will be just totally destroyed, bleeding everywhere. And they won't say anything. They'll let yeah. you. Do that. You know what I mean? Well, it depends on this, this guy. I, in my mind, and it's one of the few times ever in my life that I looked at this dude and thought I might not be able to whoop this dude. You know what I'm saying? I mean, all realisticness is. This guy might be. I, I've gotten a fight with a couple of huge dudes like him, and they're hard to knock out. And this guy had no neck. He weighed about 270, about six foot, 270, uh, maybe 6'1. Wow. And I, he, he was sitting on his bunk, sitting there, he had sunglasses on. He's like this, listening to me, you know, go, saying all this. And I'm like, dude, you know, that way you can go to the hole. <laughs> You got, if we go to the hole, I said, at least, you know, the cops aren't going to be here and shoving all your crap in the bag, breaking stuff and stuff. You'll have it all organized and we can just handle it however we want to do after that. But I said, if you want to just bang out right now, let's go ahead and pack up. <laughs> and he says, takes his sunglasses out. He goes, no, nah, dog, I'm good, man. Do you, bro. I'm on the yard most of the day anyways. It's good. You're good. Anyway, you were telling us about about um, Larry and how Larry got to Sammy's thing and they started the conflict there. But how did John Eli? Oh, then he came on your show. But how did John Eli get involved? Was well, it because of your show? No, about kind of, kind of. So at about the same time that um, I know my lighting it's so dark in here. I have to have the light, but the light is so bright. But um, we'll go back on. So about the same time that he attacked Larry. He attacked a light, maybe in the same video. Either. Now, I don't know nothing about a light, nothing. I know everybody calls him an embellisher and a liar and I hate him. And I, I don't pay attention because I don't know. I'm not researching it. I don't read mob stuff ever. That's a misconception that people have about me because I work in this space. They assume I'm like a mob expert. I'm like, dude, I am not a mob expert, especially when it comes to New York, because the only thing I know about New York is infested with rats. So my family used to call New York the rat pack. And I hear him say it, the old men, they be smoking cigars and you might bring up New York. Oh, the Rat Pack. Good old really? Rat Pack. Yeah. And so, I mean, I, I don't want to know nothing about them. And I never read about them. I don't watch documentaries, don't watch movies, don't read the books, don't watch read blogs. I know nothing about a light, basically any of them dudes, barely anything about Larry. And he's my good friend. So I guess he attacks. So, so I had had a conflict with a light before on Facebook. We had an exchange and, and he told me to F off and, and then he blocked me. But that's the only exchange I had. Yeah, and he should have. I mean, why would you have a Facebook war with somebody? You don't know me. I don't know him. It's childish to sit there and do keyboard stuff. And he blocked me. And that's the right thing to do. I, but I said that before on, on, on live stream. And like somebody recorded it, sent it to him. It's so goofy. But anyways, Larry says, the day I'm having Larry on to rebuke uh, Calandra, he says, listen, I'm going to have Johnny A-Light call in. Would you mind? Like you can call on your phone. 
And I was like, no, not at all, man. I mean, I'd love to have a light on. I know he's going to generate views. You know, everybody, a lot of guys hate him, but he's got his fans or whatever. So a light calls me ahead of time. We talked for like an hour, total gentleman, very respectful. Um, yeah, I could tell he's a legit tough guy and gangster. I don't to what degree of all the other stuff. I don't know, but I'll tell you this, John, a light was a guy that would freaking blow your head off. In a, in a heartbeat and a guy yeah, you who can friggin- tell that he was violent you can tell he, 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 yeah, whether yeah. he embellishes or not the way the guy right, exactly you can tell exactly yeah. exactly so so he calls in during a show and i actually divided that show up into two because i had larry on for the first like 45 minutes and then i teased it at the end i like i get john a like come on the phone and then i also eh, i ended it so I stay tuned Everybody tuned in. I got like twenty thousand views, you know. The next one, and so he he basically calls Jimmy Eli, um, I mean Jimmy uh, Calandra, a little pussy, a little lackey. What he was, you know. He just he calls his. He said he wasn't a tough guy. He freaking robbed safety deposit boxes or or not boxes, but the uh, PO boxes. He is not a killer. He ain't smart. He wasn't an earner. He was. His guy was just a freaking lackey for guys. That's it. And and you know he's talking crap about me and about Larry, and I'm just listening. So I'm just listening, like. Cause I don't know. I don't know. None of it. I'm just, all I was saying, no, my only time I chimed in was when I said, yeah, how does he think that he can declare that Larry wasn't made when he was a little kid who wasn't anywhere near the, even that family or that level. It's absurd to think that you can make that accusation with nothing to stand on. And even Larry said, it's like, listen, we were just ending the war, the Colombo war, junior Persico Scarpa. They all said, we want to straighten Larry out which he means make them. So they brought him into the back of a pizza place or whatever it was. And they did a pretty much impromptu making ceremony. Um, mm-hmm. The problem was one of them said afterwards, you know, you may have to do this again because the other faction, the um, Vicarino faction yeah. or whatever may not recognize you because they weren't there in the making ceremony when normally you would have all your yeah. skippers there. You may have all your top brass in the meeting and they didn't. So he said, yeah, you might have to do it again. So now uh, some of these freaking lackeys, these mob groupies grab onto it for reasons. I don't know. Why would you ever hate a guy like Larry? Um, he's got amazing stories and incredibly like uh, humble and cool dude. But you're going to look, oh, he wasn't made because he said this and that. I'm like, listen, they did make him. I was on that dude, Lee Cole show uh, two nights ago or last night, whatever it was. He's like, you know, he's like, so you believe he's made? I'm like, yeah, he was made. They did a ceremony. They make him. Some of the guys in the family might say, well, we were we were there to recognize it. So we ain't made. Who cares? He was made. The guy got made. It was a that's normal in wars. They used to right. right. The uh, and he said that he said, like, well, it's almost impossible in a war. The rules are it's almost impossible in a war to get made. I looked at the dude. I'm like, bro, you need you're, your you're, soldiers you're, loyalty. So you, you get them made in the war. Exactly. I yeah. said, bro, there's no freaking rule book. They don't follow a rule book. They don't have a handbook. You know, uh-huh. you're reading some crap on Wikipedia or Google. I hate it when people, that- by the way, like will read stuff about mafia stuff yeah. and then argue with the guys about their, their own. Yeah, yeah. Their own the life rule book says, the rule book says, <laughs> this, I'm like, dude, shut up. There ain't no freaking rule book, man. You know, they do what they want. In the middle of a war, if you need made guys, you say, come on, we're doing a ceremony. You're made, you're made, you're made, and that's yeah. it. They don't go, oh, we broke the rules. They break <laughs> rules every freaking day, man. They're always killing each other and fighting and banging each other's wives and robbing stealing I and mean, right these guys like i dude i had a guy this is insane i was being interviewed on a on a show like i was nice this is a little tiny youtube show with a thousand subscribers i try to i don't really like to do those because i'm just busy you don't have a lot of time it's not personal if i say no i'm just busy i got so much stuff going on i got five freaking jobs man trying to earn a living but i did this guy because the guy seemed nice the one guy seemed really cool he was you know smart guy and then he had this other guy i'm not even gonna say his name on this is like his co-host it's a new york cat so in the middle of this, he, I can tell you, he really listening to a whole lot. I'm saying, you can see he's like looking at his phone. And then he, the other guy says, you got anything you want to ask him or whatever? And the guy's like, yeah, man, I heard Detroit, man. They had their shit together, man. What happened? I'm like, you, you, you heard it had? it had? What do you mean? Not, nothing's changed, bro. And he's like, whoa, what do you mean? And I said, yeah, nothing changed, bro. Everything's exactly the same. He's like, well, what happened when the, you know, they got a new boss in, in, in 2003? I'm like. What? I said, there's no new boss in 2003. He's like, yeah, Tony Jacqueloni, wasn't he the boss? And well, no, Tony Jack was a street boss and, and for, for his whole freaking life. So the boss was Jack Tokel, always been the boss, same boss for my entire life for 40 years until he died in 2014. I was in prison, but he's like, he goes, no, nah, I heard it. I heard that it was Jack Tokel. He goes, no, <laughs> no, I heard it. This is what he said, bro. This is kill you, bro. He says, no. And he's like, tells me. He's like, nah, I heard it, bro. Straight from a banana guy. That's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I heard it, bro, straight from a banana guy. I'm like, 
are you kidding me, bro? I said, bro, listen, you're reading too much. Because that's why he said it. I said, you're reading too much Wikipedia or you Google. I said, bro, the, the boss is Jack Toko, man. Stop reading Wikipedia. He goes, no, I heard it straight from a banana guy. And I'm like, bro, I, it was everything. That, that took me everything to not freaking laugh. Like you, like you just did. You just start busting out. I didn't want to humiliate the guy. You know, it's a show. But I was like, nah, bro, trust me, bro. I'm t- This is what I said. Trust me, bro. You're hearing it from a Detroit guy about the Detroit boss. <laughs> He was there, exactly. which is what you want to hear. From. I said I was there. It was my life. And he's like, so this is recent. I'm like, and well, I'm related I, I, to both of the people you just mentioned. Yeah, right. right. Also, exactly. Like, by the exactly. way, I, well, that's what I said. By the way, uncle Tony Jack is my other uncle. Mayor, <laughs> said, I knew these guys. You know what I'm saying? Tony Jack was, you know, I was very close to Tony Jack. I said, so, I mean, like, how do you, how are you going to tell me? Because you heard a banana guy told you that because he didn't believe it was like contemporary. He's like, so this is recent. I'm like, well, I got locked up in 2003, but yeah, I got out of 2016. The, the internet, dude, has made people overconfident. They, they come to you and they're like, they comment on my videos all the time. Listen, something I spent yeah, yeah. 30 hours researching. Some guy will Google something and type the right. answer he got on my, and say, no, actually, you're wrong, Leo. This is the truth. I'm like, I, 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 I get to either respond to this comment or leave it there. Then it'll mislead other people. And I'm like, what? Do I, what should I do? People need to research before. But but right. about about John. So they they made when he came on your show. I watched that episode and he was mentioning. I think he mentioned there that they made this website about him. Is this now? This is the thing about Alight. He he seems to be having the Gravanos and the Gaudis both trying to get him at the same time. Huh? He's in between a rock well, and a hard place. All right. So when I had Larry on and Alight called him. A million people got their panties in a bunch at me. Now they're all mad at me. Now, here's the thing. All these people are attacking me, trolling, saying stuff. They know nothing about me. Zero. I'm just some Detroit wannabe to them. And I'm like, how about do some research, man? Google search me. Read up. Look at my Otis. Look at my, my rap sheet. Whatever. Well, anyways. So they. So now I said, just to piss these freaking guys off, I'm going to have a light back on. And so I had a light back on and did a three part series. But, but what happened with Calandra was because I had him on, he, he could said, I don't know about this. I don't know this guy, goofy gunner of uh, some, this wannabe from Detroit. And that's when I was like, dude, listen. Oh, I heard that one. I was like, that. yeah. <laughs> that's hilarious. That's- I, I was like, I'm the wannabe, bro. You had a freaking, I want to be in the mob tattoo on your ankle. No, he's I'm like, literally, bro, if you it. open the dictionary and re- look for wannabe, you see Jimmy Calandra's picture. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, Listen, and I, so I made a video. I was out trout fishing. I was camping for the weekend. So to address that, I made this video. I was sitting by this beautiful stream stuff, tents, camps right up in the hill. And I said, I told him my story, my life. You know, I'm like, bro, this is who I was born in, the family I was born into. It wasn't something I sought after or wanted to be in. I was born into it. It's mm-hmm. all I knew. The guys that you looked up to, like, were the idols, the heads of the Gambinos and all that. They were my uncles, and they freaking held me as a baby. And they freaking were around me popping 20s in my pocket when I was five years old. They taught me to play poker. And I went to their businesses and their graduations and their weddings and their anniversary parties. And that was it. My whole life, that's all I was around. So that is what it is. I wouldn't call that a wannabe. But here's the thing. What I did do when I became a criminal, basically my whole adult life, I did gangster stuff. Rob, stole, beat, you know what I'm saying? And then when I got busted, I didn't rat like you, all right? And I stayed out there till I was 29. I took my 13 to 50 years on the freaking head. I said, you know what? I'm not going to flip. I'll kill myself before I flip. So that kind of, so, so he hasn't said anything about me since then. That's it. But what can he say? He, I mean, everything I said is true, you know? I don't, I don't have no beef with them, but if you call me Goofy Gunner wannabe, then you should have a leg to stand on. I'm going to call you what you are. You sound like a punch drunk moron, bro, when you're telling your little <laughs> story. Hey, guys. And then just, you know, all he does is mere Sammy. You know bro, I, 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 I tried to watch a few of his videos, and every time I get midway, I'm like, this story has no meat. Like, you didn't do anything. Do it. This story sucks. Uh, right. You, it, you exactly. didn't anybody up. You didn't stand up to anybody. You didn't do anything right. interesting. Your story is literally about how you... Yeah. Bumped Dude, into somebody who had a story. <laughs> yeah. And you were exactly. near him. That's all. Yeah, like, exactly, I was, bro. I was in proximity to Tommy Karate or whatever. He tried to <laughs> yeah. kick my face. Uh, it was wonderful. End of story. 
That's, yeah, that's it. Yeah. It's a, you know, you go to my stories and there's, there's a, always a story there. And there's yeah, like what just happened on this thing. We were supposed to do a brief overview of the mafia thing. We got it to left and right, different directions because they're real stories and they have meat in them because they have real life experience, deep experience, you know? Right. Anyway, right it's just yeah. such a weird thing. So I wonder if, if Jimmy is like working on his own, just building a YouTube thing, or if Sammy is trying to build up some support because he seems to argue with everybody independently. But it's pretty cool. I think I'm going to title this video how Sammy, Sammy Gravano and the mob guys online are at war with each other or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's all kind of goofy to me. But like I was saying, I'm kind of phasing away to it. And this is what I've learned being in the space even for the last year. I started a YouTube show a year ago. I got 6,500 subscribers. No big deal. So most people love, you know, enjoy me. And, you know, there's always a few haters and trolls. But what I've learned is that the main thing that I learned, I started this to promote my books. Am I paralyzed? I thought, hey, this, I had never even watched a YouTube channel in my life. Never. I just, as I, my wife had started a YouTube channel. And every once in a while, I'll put a funny fishing video or a little you know, two-minute clip up of me catching a big fish or whatever. And I said, hey, if I start this YouTube channel, I heard it's getting pretty big. YouTube, maybe I can get, you know, get some attention to my books and my apparel. So I started just doing shows where I just turn the mic on and go tell a story for 45 minutes or an hour. And people liked them. So but I, what I learned is, the, the true mafia groupy ones, the obsessors, the ones who like jerk off the pictures of Sammy the Bull and, and, and Jimmy Calandra, these freaking kids, they're, they're a bunch of losers and have no money. So they're not buying. They, they love this shirt. They're like, dude, that's a badass shirt. I love our thing. It says my own city on the back. Got my seat. Oh, I love that. 30 bucks. I'm like, eh, I'd rather buy this blunt and video game. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so what I'm saying is they're not spending money. This little niche of several thousand YouTube subscribers who like jerk off to everything mob. They're not buying you know, apparel. They're not buying 500 page novels. They're not doing it. They're never going to read a 500 page novel. Are you kidding me? They can barely freaking read the newspaper. They're not, so, so I'm not catering to that demographic anymore. I, I kind of started to go that way because I had gangsters on my show, mafia, but I've had celebrities. I had actors, directors, producers. I've had them all on my show. And I just like to hear a good story. And I like to share a good story. My interviews are not interviews. They're really just conversation. I talk, you talk. I talk, you talk. You tell a story, I'll tell a story. And now we have a very organic, real conversation that's not an interview like Vlad, who's sitting there reading off his freaking cue card off his Wikipedia page. Right? Oh, you know yeah, saying? that is the most inorganic freaking. I don't know how, but he does it for the, to make the clips really like, you know, you can really cut them up. But he, yeah. on that topic, why do you think Sammy never went on Vlad? He's the only guy that didn't. Out of you guys, I mean, I think he probably because I think because Vlad, at least on this t tip, he would have the balls to rip them apart about cooperating. He'd have yeah, the balls. Yeah, Vlad asked some direct questions. Yeah, he yeah, does. he'd be like, "Listen, so you ratted on your freaking boss, your best friend, whatever. But why did you take down the other sixty-seven guys?" Gunner, you you said something that that I just never even thought of before. For some reason, I'm I'm a gullible guy. Whenever Sammy used, and I by the way, I read Sammy's book in two thousand and three or whatever. Long time yeah. ago. Originally. I read it in prison. It's one of yeah. two books I read in prison, mob books. So, I so I mean, I, when I read it and when I, I hear your most on YouTube, it, it, he, when he tells the story like John was telling me to take all the time and he was betraying me and stuff, so I, I, so I turned him in. When he says it, your brain sort of jumps over the fact and you're like, oh, that made sense. But yeah, when yeah, you said Gunner, I was, I, I, was, I, I was listening to you or, or, or I don't know if it was John, maybe John A. Light. Together, though, you guys were talking and one of you guys said... No, Sammy, you could have killed John. You're a gangster. Yeah. You could have killed your boss just like you guys killed Paul. And I was yeah. like, oh, wait, wait. Would have been a That's hero. So true. That's so true. Yeah. That he, he just like, there's no well, excuse. You were in the same cell with him. You could have killed him in the, in the, in the actual jail also. Listen, I, I, again, some people are cut just different. I, I for a long time, I, I did watch this Gotti saga and all that. And my uncle, Jack Toko, the, he hated, he hated Gotti because he was friends with Paul Castellano. So he would say all the time, when's somebody going to freaking take care of this freaking, and he'd call him a bunch of names. I won't even say, he'd say real bad stuff. He said, when was somebody going to take care of this mother, Evan, blah, blah, blah. Why doesn't Sammy do it? You know, why didn't Sammy? Now, the chin and everybody else wanted Gotti dead. The commission wanted Gotti dead. So all Sammy had to do, if he had any real balls on him, was just say, come on, John, we got to go somewhere, man. I'll meet you here, blah, blah, blah. Put a pistol in his, bam. I said, yeah, I'm man. the boss. I'm the boss now. And everybody would have been okay, Sammy, because he was smarter. Or, like, they liked him. Harder. Yeah. Earner. Never, they liked him. So you would have been a great boss. But no, you pussied out. You, you, you were scared of God, John Gotti. You were terrified. And then, you know, when, when you, it's just like me in the street, bro. All these wise guys that I was around, 
they were high level. Now, and I didn't act a fool around the, like the boss and stuff like that or Tony Jack, but there was other guys, made guys around, and I would bust their balls and I wouldn't do things they wanted or, or I'd rob some of their drug dealers or shake down their bookies and yada, yada, yada. And they would like get on me and I'd be like, listen, I got to earn too, man. For, the, the moral of that story is I was more violent than them. So yeah, that's what I was saying. They, about they had a crew. I have a crew. So, yes, you're a made guy and you got a crew, some made guys in your crew. All right. But they're not more violent than us. Yeah, that's, we got that's guns. Yes, so we got guns too. We got we shoot them. We we shown you. We use them. We beat people. You've seen it from us, so you know. So do you want to go to war with us? Because this because I I, I I knocked out some dope dealer mm. and took ten pounds of weed from him at gunpoint, and that dope dealer happened to be like kind of friends or under one of your guys, and now you're gonna come at me say I'm in the wrong. It's not, I don't give a shit about that. I needed the money. So it is what it is. What do you want to go to war over this? Hmm. We'll all exactly. die then. Cause I got yeah. guns too. And that's what Sammy. Should have but, but he didn't, he didn't have the ball. The other thing is it's like, I, I, when he writes his book, he writes, they wrote it in this, like he paints himself as a victim. And I get it. When I read it, I was like, damn dude, he kind of got screwed over. He, damn, he's yeah. the victim. But, but, but in the end, it's like, why did you freaking testify against Vince the Chin Gigante. And why did you testify against these other freaking 75 guys or whatever? That, yeah, that's no, my thing. I get Gotti. There's no, no, yeah. you're right. You, it made it so clear to me. I mean, I, I always knew about like, there was a lot of other tests. Uh, he testified against a lot of other people, but even just the Gotti thing, you could just tell the guy to fuck off. You could try to kill him in the jail or you could have tried to kill them. Like you said, just before that outside when he, he always claims he was being annoyed and Gotti was obsessed about his uh, scene and he was going to take things down. Well, you could have killed him along the way. I and mean, you were, they were killing everybody yeah. else. So they could, but anyway, he was just scared of Gotti. Gunner, I gotta let you go because remember I gotta check on my wife, so I have some some things to do. I just saw it's a little bit late, so but I, I enjoyed talking to you so much. I didn't notice the time. Well, that's cool, man. Don't worry, bro. I mean, there's so much I want to get to in the next show. Like we got to do this again because it's like things I would like to talk to you about. Things like politics and more like the creative aspect of writing and why and, and like how I yeah. got to where I am. And, and you, when we, you, when we talk, it goes organically. So we'll just, we'll just set up a call soon. Of course, as you know, the the delivery of the baby will be in the next two weeks. So I might be a little bit out of commission, yeah. but that's why I have to go check on my wife. Now we have to go to the hospital to do a, a couple of checks, but we'll have another one soon. I'll make this one about the dr mafia drama stuff, but we'll continue our conversations next time about general. Yeah, stuff. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love talking to you, bro. You're very fun. You're super intelligent. So it's such a pleasure to talk to you again. I'll talk to you soon. Say hi to your wife for me, please. I will. Thank you. And same to your wife, man. And uh, rub the belly for me. I will. All right. Bye.